to everyone. This is Dr. Antika Maiti, finally a resident of Grand Government Medical College and Sir JJ Group of Hospitals, Mumbai, presenting a paper on the role of MRI in diagnosis and early detection of complications of COVID-associated mucormycosis, a case study of 107 patients under the guidance of Dr. Shilpa Domko Nuar, ma'am, Professor NHOD, and Dr. Shivraj Ingure, sir, Associate Professor of Grand Government Medical College and Sir JJ Group of Hospitals, Mumbai. The aim of the study was where to evaluate the role of MRI in diagnosis and early detection of complications of COVID-19 associated mucormycosis in 107 patients in a tertiary care hospital in Mumbai and comparison of MRI over CT. Introduction, the emerge of the black fungus, the second wave of COVID-19 pandemic witnessed an increase in the number of opportunistic fungal and bacterial infections, the most threatening of them being invasive mucormycosis and aspergillosis. Now, mucormycosis has varied presentations depending on the organ involved, the most common being the rhino or cerebral form of mucormycosis caused by fungi of the order mucorals, including rhizopers and aspergillus, etc. These fungi spread most commonly by airborne root through the inhalation of fungal sporangiophores or by contact directly through open wounds or mucosa. These fungi never cause disease in the immunocompetent individuals. However, they can cause life-threatening disease in the immunocompromised patients. Factors favoring the disease progression in COVID-19 patients include the already weakened immune system of the COVID-19 patients attributed to the unregulated use of systemic steroids, antivirals, systemic immunomodulators, coupled with uncontrolled blood sugar levels, over-enthusiastic use of oxygen, and elevated blood ferritin levels as a part of the inflammatory process. Typically, the primary disease is initiated in the upper of the airways, progressing quickly from sinusitis to rhino or cerebral mucormycosis and then pulmonary infection by spreading rapidly via angio-invasion. Now, the role of MRI in detection and early management, as we have seen, mucormycosis spreads rapidly by the to the contiguous sites by angio invasion and causes rapid tissue destruction. If not treated aggressively, it can potentially be fatal. So MRI has an important role as it delineates the soft tissue structure as well. The fluid sensitive sequences of MRI, such as stir and flare, detects inflammation, such as myositis, periostitis, and associated edema and also osteomyelitis of sinuses and the adjacent bones. Orbit dedicated sequence of MRI is used for for detection of optic neuritis, perineuritis, and uh, um, MRI also helps in de detection of the extension of the disease process beyond the nose and paranasal sinuses. MRI helps in early pickup of the intracranial spread and complications such as infarcts, abscesses, dural sinus thrombosis, and aneurysms, etc. Since an SPC sequence of MRI is extremely helpful for evaluation of the cranial nerves, MR angiography and venography provides additional information regarding the vessel involvement. Now, advantages of the MRI over CT, as we see, Discussed, the soft tissue characterization of MRI is unparalleled. It helps in early detection of extranasal spread, bone edema, and infarcts. More, MRI is more informative regarding decision making about patient management, and MRI can also be done in patients with relative contraindications to CT, like drug allergy and asthma. Now, what are the advantages of CT over MRI? Although few, but it is extremely crucial. A CT is better for evaluation of the bone destruction. CT is faster, easily available, cheaper, and hence it is utilized for the follow up imaging in these patients. Methodology: A single center observational study was conducted between March 2021 to July 2021. Patients were conveniently selected, such as those with symptoms and signs of or who were confirmed cases of rhino or cerebral mucormycosis with past history of COVID-19 infections within the last three months or having concurrent active COVID-19 infection that is either via rapid antigen or RT-PCR positive, and such patients were included in the study. With objectives to characterize clinical epidemiological profile of these patients, the role of radiological evaluation, plan of management, and finally to see the outcome. Data was collected by history taking to HMIS, PACS, and evaluation of laboratory reports. Analysis of the collected data was tabulated in Microsoft Excel sheet. Results. Results were grouped under clinical epidemiological profile, role of radiological investigations, other investigations, the management, and finally the outcome. Under clinical epidemiological profile, we see the age group, the most common age group being 37 to 60 years. Males were the most commonly affected, compromising around 76% of the study population symptoms. The most common symptoms with which patients presented were nasal discharge, pain over face, eye or vital swelling, and decreased vision. Duration of symptoms varied between two days to three months, and on an average, it was 
was between seven days to 15 days. The time duration between COVID and development of symptoms, the average time duration was 15 days. So it could vary from four days to a few months. Associated comorbidities. The most common comorbidities being diabetes mellitus. About 92% of the patients had diabetes mellitus with 18% of them being in diabetic ketoacidosis. Hypertension was seen in 23% of the patients. Treatment history related to COVID-19 infection. Steroids were received by 70% of the patients. Remdesivir was received in 67% and oxygen was received by 82% patients. Clinical examination findings, the nose and the PNS findings. And the most specific examination under nose and PNS examination was the presence of blackish discoloration in nose and around eyes and blackish crusts in nose and paranasal sinuses. Other common findings included nasal secretions, pus, mucosa condition, polypoidal mucosa, cobblestone mucosa, etc. Ocular findings included proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, and uh, periorbital edema. Neurological findings included deterioration of the GCS, low motor neuron type of cranial of palsies, hemiparesis, etc. Oral cavity and oral cavity examination findings revealed in some patients palatal perforation, swelling in the palate, periodontal abscesses, oriental fistula, palatal erosion, blackish HR on palate and the pustules on the gums. Role of radiological evaluation. Radiological evaluation was done by CT scan of the brain orbit and PNS and MRI of brain orbit and PNS. CT scan was done with 128 slice with CT scanner with dedicated soft tissue and bone window for PNS and orbit and cerebrum window for brain with contrast if there was no contraindication. MRI of brain's PNS and orbit sequences used for brain screening was done with diffusion and susceptibility weighted and flare imaging with dedicated orbit and PNS sequences with core star T1 and T2 axial post contrast T1 fat set in all the planes for orbit with, uh, with or without post contrast brain sequences as necessary. MR angiography, venography, and CIS were added if needed. Parameters on which the, under which the CT and MR findings were reported were bone erosions. Bone erosions were seen in 101 cases, accounting for 94% of the static population and absent in seven cases which was nearly a 6% of the study population. Most common bones eroded were the medial and posterolateral walls of the maxillary sinus, lamina papyracea, bony septae of the ethmoidal aerosols and fibriform plate. Less common involvement was seen of the ancillate process, nasal turbulence, floor of the orbit, walls of frontal and sphenoid sinuses. Sinusitis, most common presentation being uh, sinusitis, bilateral pan sinusitis was seen in 87 patients, which accounted for 81%. Most common sinus involved was the maxillary sinus, least common sinus involved was the frontal sinus. Extra sinus spread has been categorized as the according to the area of involvement, such as orbital extension seen in 54%, terico-maxillary and terico fossa involvement seen in 34%, 37%, intracranial extension seen in 47%, spinopalatin, foramen and foramen rotundum involvement was seen less commonly. Now, this is a CT scan and MRI of a patient who, were, who presented very early during the mucormycosis disease spread. The CT scan uh, showing bone window and actual post contrast soft tissue window. Bone window is showing multiple sort of uh, bony defects and erosions seen in the bilateral cribriform plate, bilateral medial walls of the orbit, the lamina papyracea, bony septae of the ethmoids, and the uh, erosions in bilateral, medial, and posterolateral walls of bilateral maxillary sinuses. Soft tissue window is showing um, soft, soft tissue opacification of the bilateral maxillary and ethmoid sinuses. Now, the patient underwent face and post-operative MRI of this patient shows there is residual persistent disease in the bilateral maxillary sinuses and right ethmoid sinuses. And also there is extension of the disease process into the intracranial space involving the left basic frontal lobe and with extensive perilesional edema in the left basic frontal lobe. Now this patient were actively managed with surgical and medical management and he has been under continuous follow-up with us. The recent follow-up scan of this patient of June 2022 reveals this, that there has been a near complete resolution of disease process in bilateral maxillary sinuses and the total resolution of the disease process in the left basi frontal lobe. Hence, the role of the active and prompt management, including the imaging modality and the surgical and medical management, which plays a key role in the survival of these patients. Bone erosions and sinusitis. Some more images showing the bone extensive bone erosions in some patients were uh, as in this patient, there is extensive erosion of the floor of the bilateral maxillary sinuses extending up to the um, Al maxil alveolar process of the maxilla and the palate. Here is also one patient showing bone erosions in the cribriform plate, ethmoidal bony septae, and the medial 
wall of the right orbit and the medial wall of the right maxilla and the right nasal turbinates. The soft tissue window of the same patient showing extensive soft tissue opacification of the bilateral maxillary and ethmoid and frontal sinuses with hyperdense content within suggestive of fungal etiology. This patient had pan sinusitis with extension into the left terrigo maxillary fissure. Now, um, MRI evaluation of this patient uh, by Starker and post contrast even PATSAT images is showing there is extension of the inflammation into the right orbit, um, leading to right orbital cellulitis, right optic neuritis, and uh, hyperintense signal in all the, in these extraocular muscles of the right side suggestive of myositis. Post contrast T1 fat set images confirms the same, showing right orbital, uh, right optic neuritis, perineuritis, and myositis. Now, the post contrast flare images of the same patient is showing the, the post contrast enhancement of the pachy meninges of the left temporal lobe suggestive of pachy meningitis. With MR and geo, additional information was obtained on the internal cerebral arteries, that is, there is aneurysmal dilatation of the cavernous segments of the right cavernous in ICA. Now, one day later, the GCS of this patient dropped and Follow-up CT scan revealed hyperdense attenuation in the cortical sulci of the bilateral cerebral hemispheres with the end cerebral fissures with extension of the hyperdense blood attenuation into the bilateral lateral ventricles and third ventricle. The patient also had developed some amount of hydrocephalus with periventricular ooze around the lateral ventricles. The patient was act, um, immediately taken up for DSA angio, where it was revealed that the patient had an aneurysm of the cavernous segment of the right ICA. The patient was actively managed with coiling of the aneurysm in DSA, but the patient could not be revived and succumbed to death. Some more images showing of CT scan of a patient showing extensive soft tissue involvement of the sinuses of the ethmoid and right uh, sphenoid sinuses with bone erosions along the medial walls of the ethmoid sinuses. The post contrast Im MRI images with T1 post contrast action showing extension of the disease process into the right orbit, the right orbit leading to right optic perineuritis, myositis, extending up to the right orbital apex. T1 post contrast MPR images also showing the right orbital involvement with the right orbital cellulitis. Circ are images showing the abnormal hyperintense signal in the right optic nerve and the right extraocular muscles, suggestive of myositis and right optic neuritis. Post contrast flare images is showing the focal pachymeningeal enhancement along the right basal frontal lobe and the right temporal lobe, such as the pachymeningitis. Now we come to the complications and the role of MRI in detection of these complications. Complications has been divided into intraorbital complications, intracranial complications, and other complications predominantly picked up by MRI. Intraorbital complications, this graph is showing the intraorbital complications and its frequency. The most common intraorbital complication being the orbital cellulitis, followed by optic nerve involvement, optic neuritis, perineuritis, or extraocular muscle involvement, orbital apex involvement, followed by others such as inferior orbital and superior orbital fissure involvement, intraorbital abscess, superior ophthalmic vein involvement, orbital periostitis, etc. Among the intracranial complications, we see the most common being ischemic infarcts and meningitis, followed by cavernous sinus thrombosis, ICA thrombosis, ICA aneurysm, uh, followed by SH and IV due to the rupture of aneurysms, intracranial nerves involvement, element type of palsy of the cranial nerves. Other, uh, other in, intracranial complications are meningoencephalitis, abscess formation, lower extension of the inflammatory process. Now some images of the intraorbital complications are, this is an image of post face status of a patient. T2 core and T1 fat set images are showing post contrast uh, hyper intensities of this uh, right optic nerve and the right extraocular muscles, suggestive of right orbital cellulitis, optic neuritis, and myositis. And also there is a focal leptomeningeal enhancement in the right basal frontal lobe, suggestive of pachymeningitis. Another patient showing similar features in the MRI with the T1 fat set post contrast imaging, so showing right orbital cellulitis, optic neuritis, and perineuritis with the right uh, orbital periostitis. This is the right orbital post contrast enhancement on T1 post contrast imaging, suggestive so of orbital periostitis.
Another patient, CT scan and MR findings of another patient who had gross left-sided uh, proptosis on CT scan. It was evident the patient had preceptal edema, the extension of the inflammatory process into the left orbit, so just of left orbit, the cellulitis, preceptal cellulitis with grossly deformed left globe. On MRI, these findings were confirmed and, ever, and even better delineated, showing left-sided or preceptal cellulitis and orbital cellulitis, preceptal edema, there's deformation of the left lobe with left side orbital cellulitis, right, left optic neuritis and myositis. Star core images showing this, confirming the same with abnormal hyperintense signal in the left optic nerve and the left extraocular muscles confirming the diagnosis. Another image showing the intracranial complications as on flare post contrast imaging, this patient had a focal pachymeningeal enhancement along the right temporal lobes and right cavernous sinus thrombosis. Another CT and the diffusion weighted imaging of another patient showing there is diffusion restriction along the posterior aspect of right parietal lobe and the right occipital lobe and uh, suggestive of vasculitic infarcts. On CT scan, this uh, appears to be hypodense irregular in defined areas in the right to posterior parietal lobe and occipital lobe, which were confirmed to be infarcts on MRI. Hence, this infarcts were early and easily picked up on MRI as compared to CT scan. Imaging findings of CT and MRI of another patient on whom ill-defined hypodense areas were seen in the left temporal lobes and which were non-enhancing. On MRI, it was confirmed to be left temporal lobe collection and extension of the disease process. And this clearly depicts non-enhancing areas with peripheral enhancing enhancement on T1 post contrast imaging. On flare imaging, it shows perilesional edema. On post contrast flare imaging, there was focal pachymeningeal enhancement along the left frontal and left temporal lobes, such as to a pachymeningitis. Other complications which were predominantly picked up on MRI, the most common of them being the pterygoid masseter muscle and temporalist muscle involvement and myositis, temporomandibular joint collection, osteomyelitis of the adjacent bones, wall of maxillary sinus periostitis, orbital periostitis, cortical laminar necrosis, masticator space involvement, CVST, etc. Other investigations, including microbiological and histopathological investigations, a microbiological and histopathological examinations can only confirm neuromycosis and the species involved in the disease. Microbiological investigations were beneficial to find out the drug sensitivity so as to comment on sensitivity resistance of organisms which were isolated from a given specimen. Bramstein, Keurig smear, culture, HPR, with pyridic acid ship and gomory methanomic case stains were performed. Treatment, surgical management, and medical management. Surgical management and medical management were mostly used in a com uh, combined form. Surgical management include PES with debridement plus or minus orbital exenteration with uh, drainage of uh, brain abscess as and when required. In decision was made on case-to-case -case basis. Medical management included injection amphotericin with or without posaconazole. Now, images of some of these complications are right temporal, this uh, image showing right temporalis masseter and the pterygoid muscle myositis and right zygomaticus osteomyelitis. This post contrast T1 uh, fat side image is showing post contrast enhancement of the lesser wing of the bilateral lesser wing of the spinal bone, so just a bilateral lesser wing of the spinal osteomyelitis. Another patient in whom their uh, MRI is showing a left parapharyngeal collection, the disease process is extending to involve the left uh, masticator space, the temporalis, the pterygoid, and the masseter muscles. And on this image, the extension of the collections is also seen to be involving extending up to the left temporal mandibular joint, leading to left temporal mandibular joint osteomyelitis. CT scan of a patient here, it is depicting the left cavernous sinus thrombosis and the left ICA thrombosis. Another patient in whom the CT scan was showing bilateral ACA infarcts with bilateral infarcts of the ganglio-capsular regions. Another patient in whom the flare post-contrast image is showing pachymeningeal and leptomeningeal enhancement along the bilateral basic frontal lobes with peripheral enhancement of a region in the right basic frontal lobe. On diffusion-weighted imaging, there was a diffusion restriction of the right basic frontal lobe, suggestive of abscess formation in right basic frontal lobe. Now we come to the outcome. The outcome of this patients was the most uh, crucial of the of the study, since in outcome the overall death rate of the patient was found to be seventeen percent, and overall survival of these patients was found to be eighty two point two percent. Now outcome was also uh, correlated with the 
for patients who had undergone surgery. It was found that the percentage of deaths in patients who had undergone surgery was extremely low, around 11 to 12 percent, and the percentage of patients who did not undergo surgery, the percentage of deaths in patients who did not undergo surgery was around 82 percent. Hence, we can clearly state that the active management of this patient, starting from the imaging to surgery, surgical and medical management, played a crucial role in the reducing the percentage of deaths and improving the overall survival of these patients. Hence, we conclude in the study, 107 patients were evaluated in which 76% were males. Most common presentation was by paranasal sinuses involvement. Most common radiological finding was pan sinusitis, where maxillary sinus involvement was most common, and bone erosions were most commonly eroded bone being the medial and posterolateral walls of the maxillary sinus, lamina papillaria, etc. Spread of the fungi into the contiguous structures led to most of the complications. The most common intracranial complication being ischemic infarcts, meningitis, followed by cavernous the sinus thrombosis, whereas most common intraorbital complication being orbital cellulitis followed by optic nerve involvement. There was a definite role of MRI as we've seen it helped in early detection of the disease as well as the spread of the disease process beyond the paranasal sinuses into the adjacent important structures. MRI also helped in early detection of complications as well as the life threatening ones such as infarct, cerebritis, brain abscess, etc., which was picked up on CT at a on later date. The MRI also helped in rapid, uh, rapid and aggressive management by early pickup of these complications. Now, this rapid pick, early pickup, the early diagnosis of the complications combined with surgical and medical options played a crucial role to improve the survival of the patients. Thus, the early detection of complications was beneficial for improving the survival of the patients. CT definitely was a first-time modality because of its wide availability and being faster. And CT also helped in evaluating the bone destruction better. City had a crucial role in the operative and pre-operative management for evaluation of bony landmarks and vital structures. Then CT was also helpful for the follow-up imaging in these patients. These are my references. Thank you.